With that sword, Grayskull will soon be ours. You! Halt! Bring the sword to the championship. What champion? By the power of Grayskull, I have the power? What did it feel like? You turned into a big ol' He-Man! Were you still you on the inside, but you look like him on the outside? Or was he the same on the outside as he was on the inside, and you were somewhere else entirely? Ow! That's a lot of questions. The Master's nemesis have arrived. The power of Grayskull is a lie. Who's there? Why, Adam? Don't you recognize your Uncle Keldor? This is our fight, too. I'm at least the master of technology? Master of magic. Master of the wild. Master of demolition. Ah! Apologies, this is all just very exciting. Like a story of old. By the power of Grayskull! We have the power! Why are you coming at the king? Why are you coming at the god? Saving Eternia is up to us. Rise, my dark masters, and wreak havoc! To know oneself is to truly become universe. A master of the what now? Behind this gate lies great power. We must approach with caution. Adam! Wait up! Wait up! <sighs> Hello! I am Tiffany Smith, and you may know me as Andra from Masters of the Universe Revelation. I am so excited to be here with you at PowerCon. Now, I know that this year looks a little bit different. We wanted to make sure that we were extra safe with COVID, but we did the next best thing. So we have got a virtual panel to talk about the things that we all know and love and are so near and dear to our heart. Of course, I am talking about Masters of the Universe. So today's panel is all about the new animated series from Mattel Television coming to Netflix on September 16th, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Now, I could talk about it for a while by myself, but I thought it would be a little bit better to bring some of the creatives behind the show here so they could tell you all about creating this awesome show. So joining us, we have the showrunner and EP, Rob David. Hello, hello, PowerCon. We miss you, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got our co-executive producer, Jeff Matsuda. How you doing? Hello, good. <laughs> I need my water. It's, I mean, this is what a panel is like. We're live. <laughs> We're we live. may not be there live in person, but we are live filming this right now. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here with you guys to chat. Uh, and obviously, totally. Rob, we know each other a little bit. I know. We did something together. I know. We did. We did. That was such a great time. How crazy is it for you to get to come back and have this show as well as Master of the Universe Revelation at PowerCon this year? It is the craziest, most wonderful thing in my, my entire life. I, I, Jeff and I always joke about this. Like when this show comes out and, and it's done, we're going to turn into dust and float away. <laughs> I mean, this has just been a complete uh, dream come true because I'm a huge uh, Motu fan. And everyone here knows what Motu means. Of course, we're talking to our people. Um, but uh, so, and to be able to do not just one show, but two shows and do something that like I've wanted to do and I know is important to Mattel Television and Mattel in general, which is to really unlock the full value of, of Masters of the Universe as a multiverse, mm -hmm. right? This is the, one of the greatest things that, uh, about Motu is that it's not just one incarnation, one show, one storyline. From the very beginning, it's had different incarnations. And to be able to do two different shows, one uh, continuing the storyline from, from when we grew up, and then one aimed directly um, at kids 
you know, the next generation of fans who are going to meet these characters for the first time is just a total dream come true. And we just got to see the trailer for the new series. It looked, like you're saying, it looks very different than anything I've ever seen within the world of Eternia. What is that like for you guys, really bringing the trailer to everybody and having everyone experience it along with you? Well, for me, it was, <clears throat> it was like having another kid. I was so nervous. <laughs> I was so nervous when it came out, but just, uh, we've spent so much time designing this new Motu universe, and it's just been... It's it's been a ton of fun. It 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 it, it has been. I mean, when the, when the, the trailer came out, you're like, okay, it's it is it's one of those things where you know you want to catch people by surprise and and have it feel fresh and alive mm -hmm. uh, and vibrant. But at the same time, you know, you want to be able to have old school fans, you know, recognize those elements that are core to the to the the property, which we can we can get into. I mean, just to talk a little bit about the difference between Revelation and uh, and this show. I mean, in Revelation, the whole spirit of that was to create a, a love letter to the 1980s storyline, mm -hmm. all the 80s, with some cherry-picked um, elements that we love from the classics line and from other incarnations that we did in DC Comics, and and then keep that story going, keep mm -hmm. it going for the, for the fans who grew up on it, not just recreate or just uh, do it as a nostalgia piece, but to actually tell the story that, you know, yeah. that we love. Not a reboot. Not, not a reboot, and to keep it going. And you get to see things like, that you've always wanted to see, like. Um, He-Man and Skeletor are actually fighting. Right, <laughs> completely, completely. And then, and then an exploration of why is Adam the guy to hold that sword? Why is, what is it about him, unlike Skeletor? We last left in part one, Skeletor got the, the sword but what is it about Adam that made him special you know you'll get to see him reconciling with his dad and Tila and I don't care if we're going to spoil because to this crowd it's not a spoiler to say that Tila will reach her destiny and you all know what we're talking about yeah and to keep the story going uh you know I, I would like to say if, if um if the original like if if the original 80s era was our new hope just to get a little Star Wars here <laughs> then part one is our Empire Strikes Back and part two is our Return of the Jedi um, and then I think, you know, going forward, we'll keep the story going um, to do things that we've always wanted to do with those characters. And then on this show, yeah. this show, man, this is just about us being able to take the abundance of riches from the last um, 40 years and then distill it to its core concepts and then re-express it in a way that is relevant and vibrant to a, a, a kid today, yeah, well, meeting these characters for the first time. And Jeff, you said, you know, you're like, you were nervous. It was like Super having nervous. another kid and putting it out into the world. <clears throat> but I think that's something where it's like, you're nervous because you're so passionate about it and excited about it and have a connection to the franchise. So what is your first Motu memory? Like, what was your first connection to this world? I think when I was a kid, I used to play with the toys all the time. And I always loved just the universe that, that Motu's from. Every character, well, well, the one thing I love about the, the, the characters is you could always tell what their powers are. Not all franchises are the same way. So you look at all these characters and you can tell exactly what they're going to be doing. And I think that's important for storytelling. And that was uh, m one of the main reasons I bought all the toys when I was a little kid. <laughs> and I would still today. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. mean you still are. That's why you got yeah. this job. Like, I don't want to buy right. them anymore. I'm going to work there and then yeah, I'll just yeah. get some of them. <laughs> to totally. That is totally true. I mean, I think like uh, me... For sure, and I think it's true of most people. Like I learned how to tell stories by playing with those toys, um, and it, that's what inspired me to become a writer, a producer, and, and eventually work for Mattel and on on this show. And one of the coolest things about those characters was that they were, especially in its earliest incarnation, that they all had a specialty. They all had something that um, that made them distinctly who they were and brought value to it. Whether it was mm -hmm. they used it for good or for evil. So for this show, we wanted to just kind of rest on like the set our our you know our temple on that and build out from that core idea but do it in a way that's kind of relevant uh to kids growing up today um yeah, go ahead. well kind of jumping off of that you know this is 40 years that this franchise has been around what do you guys think it is about he-man masters of the universe that people continue to connect with that makes the show still feel relevant for fans from the original show or bringing it to new fans now well i think it's that this idea that um, of self-empowerment, um, this idea that everybody has the power, that there's something about them that if they could unlock it um, and express it, they could uh, use that to transform themselves or their world. So I think with this kid show, we wanted to actually show how that principle of He-Man truly does apply to, um, to everybody. And the way that this mythology works for this new show is that you take something like the power of Grayskull and it's, you know, if you think about it as all the primal powers 
uh, of, of the magic that created the universe, right? And everybody in the world um, resonates with one of those powers. Mm -hmm. And some of them resonate so much with one of those powers that they could have the potential to master it. So it's not just He-Man, but He-Man is their, is their leader. Um, and But it's about how, as this group, um, they will kind of go on this journey together mm -hmm. um, from day one. And whenever, like, we re whenever you reimagine a show, it's it's we want to take the essence from what it was in the past and just reignite it with 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 just new energy. So for this show, you know, like people like Ram Mam, she she didn't exist before, but she is like, did I say Ram Mam? Yeah, you did. The new <laughs> so from Ram Man, it's it has all the same essential aspects of of him, but put into a new a new way of telling the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of this idea is also to, a couple guiding principles that I know I want to do and, and Jeff and I like talk about all the time is bring in um, the idea of mastery into Masters mm -hmm. of the Universe. To, to, because I think like what resonates with kids today is they, they definitely want to see themselves in their heroes and they actually want to go on that journey. They want to, they want to go on the journey where you start off as a white belt and <clears> you've got to go bump, 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 bump to become a black belt. It's like, when we were growing up, we kind of were in that last age of instant heroes mm -hmm. where everyone was just instantly perfect. And if you look at the very first mini comics, you know, there was no Prince Adam. It was just He-Man, this wandering badass barbarian. And then uh, DC Comics and, and then Filmation said, no, we should bring up a Prince Adam character uh, so that kids can relate. But yet Prince Adam persona, the wayward prince was a put on, mm -hmm. right? And then the 2002 series said Prince Adam, you know, no, it's let's, it's not, a, he really is a kid, but as He-Man, he's he's instantly perfect. Whereas this show, we really want to say, no, they're, they are they are younger and they're gonna get these powers, but by getting these powers and they're getting it because it, it's who they are and they're worthy of it, they still now need to come of age yeah. and, and learn who they really are to become full masters. Right, and I think like it, artistically, um, silhouettes are so important. So it's good to go from skinny Adam, then when he transforms, he turns into an yeah. enormous, powerful He-Man. So it's always just having you know instant readability with these characters when you see them. Yeah, I mean, I, I watched the series and I did this as a kid and I always wanted to be like my, the characters that are on there. And honestly, yeah. like I've started doing way more push-ups to get my <laughs> arms like Andres, because I'm like, yeah. I want to be like her. She's so cool. Totally, totally. <laughs> I just want to say, I, and I'm speaking to to our friends at PowerCon, um, that when we're we're reimagining these things, we are so not only are we enamored with everything that came before, but we we know it. It's in our blood, and we don't take anything lightly. So if you take a character like Duncan, because I can know, you know, people would say, oh, he's he's now he's now younger. Is he this? And it's like we take the character of Duncan and we say, okay, what are all the elements that make him who he is? And we want to make sure that he is a part of this team, so he can't, so he has to be on this journey with them and represent technology. But there are other aspects like mentorships and things like that, which are those archetypes are so important to um, to Motu in general that they we have to make sure that they are represented in the story, whether it's from him or from somebody else. Those things can't ever be gone because if you take away the DNA of what made the original great, it's no longer Motu. So the the hat trick for us every day is how do we keep this relevant and fresh, but in its mm -hmm. bones, it's completely always firing with all the, the Motu DNA. And, and I can tell everyone that Rob is the gatekeeper of He-Man and all things Motu. <laughs> I'll come into the office and I'll be like, Rob, what do you think? Man at arms. <laughs> and he'll always pull it back. Like I, I keep on trying to push and then Rob will pull it back to what the essence of the characters are. So I really appreciated that. <laughs> and this is totally, I, I don't care, I will fully say it. Revelation, I feel like everyone on who watched that show was like, why is Man in Arms so hot? Why is Duncan yeah. so attractive? And I feel like even making him young, he's still cute. Like, yeah. <laughs> he still has that vibe and that energy. Maybe that's just me. But I feel like cool. the internet will agree with me. Um, but kind of speaking that Rob is the gatekeeper, you are working on these two shows that are very different, Master of the Universe Revelation and He-Man and the Master of the Universe at the same time. What was that like for you? How do you keep those two worlds separate and make sure uh, that they feel Similar but totally different. Well, the 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 first thing is, I mean, I actually, you know, uh, this show in some ways is one of my primary obligations of like trying to to redevelop it and, and express it for the next generation of fans because that's that's our future. But revelation is equally important. The whole brand is important. So what I do is I basically 
I have to, I have a <laughs> lot, lot of different Bibles. Some I've written, some I haven't written, and I have to just keep <laughs> them at my fingertips. And then I'm working with great partners. Um, Andrew Goodman in, uh, in Mattel's franchise department is a great, is a great uh, friend and collaborator. And we basically, you have to boil it down to what is the core DNA of the property? What are the core elements? What are the core universal truths? And then no matter what you do, you have to make sure that every incarnation resonates with those key essential things. If you, if you know, outside of that, you have a lot of room for fun and variation, yeah. but it's gotta have the, the core truth. And then you just fake it. And then people say, is that right? And you go, uh-huh. And they're like, I hope they don't look it up on Google because they'll know I don't know. <laughs> so what would you say is the core mission for He-Man and the Masters of the Universe? <laughs> That's a big one. Well, I think in this, in 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 general, as a as a, as a brand or a franchise or intellectual property, one purely as a friend of, of a fan to bring it back and have everybody be able to enjoy it for different reasons and different expressions of it. Um, and then, in particular, for this show, you know, for kids to love it, the the, the property again to take it forward, and then in terms of the storyline, for these kids to realize who they are inside and out become true masters and kick Skeletor's butt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I've, I've shown my kids and it, the, the goal for me was just to really have the new generation of kids just love it, to see something that they could own for themselves. Like we have our, our stuff that we own and now it's sort of nice that our kids can have, or this generation could have something that they own as well. Yeah. And I know we talked a bit about, like you're saying that it's a team and each person having their specific mastery and gift. And I think that you guys might've brought a little clip for us. We did. Are you guys ready for it? Oh, let's show All right, it. Let's take a look. I still enjoy seeing this. I love it. It's amazing. <laughs> what I think is so cool is that, you know, there's, it starts the transitions and they're saying, I have the power. And then at the end, it's, we have the power. And I think it's something that I don't know if as a kid I realized about the show, but now seeing it as an adult where you're like, both things are so important. You need to feel empowered in yourself. And then when you come together with other people that feel that way, it's even greater. That is, I mean, this is a story of like, the, they're all individuals and they've got their journey, but it's really about how they come together 
as a family and, and find each other. Um, just to give you a little context for some of those characters, I mean, you have Adam, who is Prince, um, but doesn't start off knowing that. And I, I, I put that in that context because that's something that allows us to have take him on this journey. And when he starts off, he's living in, in, a, in a tribe, uh, spoilers, but it comes out in like 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> September 16th. Yeah, which has echoes in some ways to some of the first mini comics where we first introduced He-Man uh, from a, a jungle tribe. And he's got a friend growing up there named Crass and a fatherly figure named Cringer who's We'll explore what that name means. And he lost his claws to a poacher named Rakaz, and you know who that guy is. So all of these characters, and Duncan has a story, and, and Tila has been growing up with visions of, of Grayskull and a voice in her head, and she doesn't know who or what that's all about. So she goes on a journey. And then these, these basically these orphan kids come together, find each other, become a family, and go on this journey together. And that's the moment where Adam, as He-Man, first comes up with this idea that, hey, maybe the, this power that I have is something I can share with, with my new family. Um, and so excited for you guys to see it in action. Well, and just from watching that clip, can you kind of jump into talking about doing the animation and figuring out what each character's transition was going to look like? Yeah, so when we were doing this, we tried to figure out um, how can we best honor the characters that they are. So we just worked our way through all, through all of them. Um, we put some lightning in there. Um, and then what do we do for the characters, the... For the transfer. Oh, we, yeah, we, we had their we had their helmets, and we had to make sure that each one of them had that their their power weapon in there yeah. mm -hmm. to make sure it, it, that, that the kids see that it translates right into them. Everybody has like their own talisman that essentially, whether it was something like He Man, which was forged by King Grayskull himself, or um, or if it's something that was a part of them as a kid growing up, like Crass has this her her trusty helmet mm -hmm. that she got from her folks, you know, becomes her new power weapon. Everybody has that one talisman that allows them to unlock that power uh, within themselves. And then those, like, so Jeff is too modest. He's a, like a, a visual <laughs> genius and he's been working uh, with um, House of Cool and CGCG. These are the same studios behind Troll Hunters and CGCG has done uh, Clone Wars. I mean, this is like, I, I'm every single time stuff comes back in, I just get blown away. Yeah, like every morning we get these we get these dailies, they come in and I really feel like it's Christmas. Like every <laughs> morning when I get to, normally you go to, you're like, oh, but for this show, I'm like, this is beautiful. It looks great. I'm so proud of the work we've done. I really, I have never worked on anything this good ever. And it's really as a family, I just want to give a shout out to like our team. You know, we're up here, but it's like, we've got our, our little Masters of the Universe team, you know, me and Jeff, and we have Susan Corbin who produces the show and she produces Revelation. Mm -hmm. She is like, I, I call her Scotty to, uh, to the Enterprise. Like, <laughs> she's the miracle worker. She keeps us going. She really makes it just the whole thing go. And Melanie Shannon, who's our creative exec and, and uh, creative supervisor in the show is like my basically <coughs> the other half of my, my brain. And Brian Q. Miller is our story editor. And it's been wonderful in bringing the, the characters to life and giving them voice. And and you know, and then we have everybody, Stuart and Wendy and Sarah and Gary. This is like our, <laughs> our core team, and every day is a total joy. Well, I have to say, watching the transitions, I feel like this is something you always do as a kid watching cartoons, but I'm like, Tila's transitions is my favorite to sorceress. Yay. But I have to say, I feel like there's something missing from the show. Hmm. Like uh. Andra? Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, I would love to have it there. I would love to. I mean, I feel like it would take the show to a whole other level. <laughs> totally. Right, Tiffany Smith is like the coolest, nicest person. I just like hands down. Like, these are the, actually the nicest people I've ever worked with. <laughs> Tiffany is a joy. Total well, joy. Thank you. I feel like it's something though, that comes across in this show. Like I, I've said this a bunch of times, but I'm like, when you're working with people that you really connect with and there's a kindness and joy behind the scenes, I think it comes across in whatever project you're doing. Yeah. And I think it totally comes across on this show. Um, and you talked a little bit about, I'm obviously so awkward that I was like, that was so nice. I was like, change the subject, Tiffany. Um, <laughs> talk a little bit more too about the animation, the CG that you guys did for this one. Cause when was the decision made that was like, this is the vibe, this is the look that we want to have for this show? Well, I think, I think what's, what CG does is that it really, I think unlocks what Motu can be to me. Um, in 2D, I love 2D as well. But uh, 2D, there is someone drawing He-Man or this character thousands of times. So you have to economize what the design is. For this, we're like, you know what? We want these guys to have all this stuff everywhere. We want Ram Mam to have a helmet. And we didn't have to hold back at all. These are the characters exactly the way we've all envisioned them to be. And that's really rare. So I think the, it being in CG and uh, CG CG from Taiwan, they did the animation and it's 
completely unbelievable to me. Uh, we have 2D effects to complement yeah. the CG, so we could always have uh, a good uh, marriage between the two. But um, yeah. And then uh, what I also love about CG, outside of just like the hyper real textures you get on things, but the, the, the mobility of the camera within a 3D space, it just right. opens up storytelling in a really cool way. And all of these characters have got these incredible startling powers that they discover more as they go. And they have something called a master strike, um, which is which we don't actually call it that in the show. It's we jokingly referred to as doing the gold eye thing. Because they're kids <laughs> and they're learning these things yeah. as they go. But they're but it's like it just allows the the animation teams to just have this amazing moments where they just launch into these incredibly over the top no two style attacks. It's just so cute. So much fun. Yeah, HOC, House of Cool in Toronto, they did all of our boards and they just killed it. When we get storyboards back, I've never seen storyboards so good and then they get translated perfectly into these master attack combos. I love it. Well, I know like the transitions and stuff, I was already being like, oh, what do they do? And I know that kids are gonna be doing the same thing, like the poses and oh, the different things for so. transitions. And <laughs> I mean, I did it in my underoos when I was a kid. So <laughs> I'm sure there'll be some of that, but they might look a little bit cooler than I did. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> so kind of taking the fact that you guys were fans of the world to begin with as kids, how do you take some of the bits and pieces from that story and that world and make it new and put it with these new characters, because even though they're characters that we know, you guys are telling totally new stories with them. I think, yeah, I mean, you, you, you boil it down what you think is important to the things, and you just look for ways to tell it that are, are fresh and relevant. One is, I do, think, I do think there's a kind of like the aspect of having a team concept um, and understanding what it means to be a master of the universe. Like, we kind of use this show to define what that power is, and having that kind of family, I think I think kids growing up today, th their their friends and their family are are so important to them, and understanding why um, you know what mission they're on together is really important. And then looking for um, I'll give an example one example um, of some, making something new and fresh, but keeping it grounded on on Motu is Orko, because um, mm -hmm. here like the the essential DNA of Masters of the Universe is is magic and technology, and as genres, um, fantasy and sci-fi. You have to have both in Masters of the Universe. And you can, on a mixing board, dial one up over the other. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, this is not a sci-fi version of, of Motu. This is a fantasy sci-fi where there's some future forward tech elements that are dialed up a little higher than they were before, but they're still absolutely represented. And then taking a character like Orko and then being able to use him as kind of our mascot emblem of those two things to have this robot who is also a wizard. So you have the magic and the tech in one thing and then to, to, to kind of um, make him so lovable where he's a little bit delusional um, <laughs> because he's a robot who has now believes himself to be a, this great wizard of old Orko the Great. But it, it, but it's not, he's, it's like his, his yeah. programming is a little messed yeah. up. So you just, you, you yearn for him to like to, to succeed and no one did, would ever wipe his memory or, or reboot him <laughs> and you just want him to do it. And he's played by Tom Kenny who does his, the voice of SpongeBob. Um, and uh, the performances, where all the actors are great. Uh, the, a, it's a terrific cast and Colette Sunderman is our, our di voice director. She was also the voice director mm -hmm. of um, Revelation, Revel Revelation yeah. and she's a genius. So it's just, it's a lot of fun. What is that like for you guys when you find the right actor for each character? Because obviously the animation is so important, getting the story right is so important, but then having someone actually bring that character to life with their voice in the booth and then finally on the screen, what does that feel like for you? I think it like it changes everything. You know, we you know, Rob will write the scripts or and and you'll see it and you'll read it, but you don't really know what they what what it's about until you see them in the booth. And then they could just breathe such life into it where now it helps me design. Like before it was just Oh, this is this is a Duncan or something, and then you hear them speaking, and you're like, oh my gosh, Anthony Del, Del Rio is is amazing. And then it changes my design process. I will start catering towards the towards the voice actors because yeah. they're so awesome. That on the happened show. with with Anthony Del Rio. We, we like I had conceived Duncan just a, a little slightly little differently, and we heard the 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 auditions, and there was one actor who uh, who who was kind of more exactly the way what I was imagining. And then there was. Uh, Anthony was just like, who had just extra kind of element to it. I don't want to like spoil it. And I was like, oh, that's great. And I was talking to Brian Q. Miller, who's our story editor. Like, How do we lean into that? And and we just kind of tweaked it a little bit to match him. And then other times, like uh, Yuri Lowenthal plays um, plays Adam and He-Man, I 
I was playing that Sony Spider-Man game with my <laughs> son and daughter, and he is Peter Parker and Spider-Man, and that, and I, he did such a great job, and I wanted this Adam to kind of take some of those Peter Parker-esque qualities mm -hmm. into into He-Man, and it was like, oh, just let's just get the go to the source. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and I think. I was lucky enough to get to watch the series and there's so much comedy in it that I love so much because the original series, there was comedy, but this is like a different kind of comedy where it's yeah. like, they kind of all play off of each other and they all have their funny moments. Um, Without and I, compromising on the stakes. Yeah, yeah. And that's a thing. Like I think Orko is the character for me that through everything is always the go-to and the touchstone for what Eternia, what master of the universe is for me, because he pulls at your heartstrings in Revelation. He does the same thing in this series. I love Orca. And I think it's so interesting that you can do that in such different, like, vibe, feel, genre, or where the stakes are, you know, maybe feel a little bit more adult or feel a little bit more kid, that Orko still comes across as that character. Well, talk about archetypes. He, Orko as an archetype is the child. And he looks at the world through the childlike eyes. And you can change some of the details, but if you get that archetype right, you, 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 he's always Orko. Mm -hmm. It's so true. I love it so much. <laughs> um, I love hearing you guys talk about the show, too, because you can see the passion. You can see the excitement. You can see the joy where you're saying, you know, you get storyboards and you're so excited. What was the most fun thing for you guys about bringing this project together? <laughs> Tough questions. Working Tough questions. <laughs> you know what? That's actually what, what Rob's saying is true. I think I've never worked on a team that was, you know what? It's important in, on shows or in anything that everyone's in the right seats. And on this show, everyone is in the right seats. I mean, we were able to just create and go nuts as much as we could. And, you know, that's, that's rare, I think. So everything has just been ramped up to, to, to 11 to me for this show. Yeah. Oh, same here. Same here. <laughs> It's like you, you try to be professional, like when you're doing this, like, yes, we're, we have a job here and we're doing, but we're like, right. yeah, yeah. Well, and I think that's something that's why conventions are so cool because oh. you get to celebrate with people. And like I said, I know this year is a little bit different, but you're still getting that energy. You still get to go on social media and see people pumped about the show or talking to friends and getting text messages. Cause that was, that was the thing for me where it's like, I was getting texts from friends watching revelation and it would be, you know, someone that watches a kid and now they're watching with their kids. Yeah. Um, which I was like, really? How old are kids? <laughs> <laughs> but I loved it. But I think the same thing is going to happen with this show where it's like, people are going to watch it and get, you know, the adults are going to watch with their kids. Cause they're like, this is he man. What version yeah. is this? It's like, it's, it's funny. Cause masters is really a co generational co viewing experience. And like revelation is like, you know, is for parents or adults, you know, to share with, with their kids. And this is like kids to share with their parents, you know? So it's like, <laughs> yeah. you can all just watch this together knowing that they're kind of, they're tailored to different, different POVs. Yeah. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, I, I, I feel the exact same way. It's like I said, watch with the kids. The kids love it. I also wanted to add that, like what we we're talking about before, the, the energy that we had making the show really sh comes out into the show. Uh, we have like these meetings with a bunch of us and it usually just, turns into Rob and I talking about comics for about 15 minutes. Oh my God, yeah. As any meeting should. As any meeting Completely. does. And it's, yeah. it just, it permeates well into everything. It's Complete. true, it's true. Um, was there anything that when you guys were working on this that one of you guys pitched to the other one or were like, we should try this, we should do this, that one of you was like, uh-uh? Or were you like literally on the same page the oh, whole time? Oh, there's always rounds. There's always, <laughs> like, there's always like, you know, just like, and then you, you want to be able to, to just go for it, like a total trust thing. Like you could, you know, you have the right to be colossally wrong, yeah. right? And because sometimes it's, if you don't do that, you're not gonna get that great idea that came out right. of nowhere. Yeah. Right, we just wanted to push and just make, really make the best show that we can make. And so maybe, you know, there's there's some stuff in there that's weirder than, than that, but we, it's all, we went as far as we could, I think. Yeah. Well, and I know we talked about this at the top a little bit, that you guys were obviously fans of this world growing up. What brought you guys to this show in particular? Like, how did you guys end up working on this project, each of you? Well, I, <laughs> so I, um, I was recruited by Mattel as a writer because I was a writer and story editor and um, producer and kids and family entertainment. And they recruited me to come inside, to have a writer inside to help redevelop uh, masters in particular for uh, across the entertainment landscape, um, as well as other properties, but, but Mochu is my core thing. And it was all kind of leading up to this. But along the way, um, like I, I had this opportunity to, to do great things, like write the DC comic book for a long time. And 
I mean, Eternity War, before, before the show, the Eternity War was like, and the, the origin of Shira story before that was like my total passion. I'd wake up at two in the morning, go into the kitchen with my laptop and just write down all these <laughs> things. And some of the ideas, especially in the last issue, if anyone read Eternity War, the last issue of it has a lot of setup for what this show, a lot of the show became. Um, and then this has just been a total passion. And there was a development, uh, early development, where, um, where we were concepting art based on some of these ideas. And Jeff was one of the the uh, the artists that like I, I, we went to, and his stuff was always really good and better. <laughs> and it was kind of like, and then it was like, well, we're going to actually make this show. And uh, by the way, Megan Casey, I want I'm on a list of shout outs, but Megan Casey is our exec at uh, at Netflix on this kid uh, show, and she's terrific. Um, but when we were putting this together, it was like we've got to just get this guy in to to produce with us and just and just blow this out. And all of like, you know, Jeff's got this amazing sensibility, um, amazing eye. So all these kind of ideas kind of focused through his his visual sense mm -hmm. and came out, to my mind, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, you're <laughs> welcome. Um, for me, it was, uh, I think Mattel, Shannon Nettleton would, uh, would take me out to lunch uh, and maybe three or four times and every year she'd say, we're gonna, we're gonna do He-Man and we're gonna make it awesome one day and we, we would like you to come on and then It'd be another lunch, and it'd be like, we're just gonna eat lunch today. We'll, we'll see what happens. And then one day, she really knew it. She's like, yeah. every time. She's like, Shannon, by the way, is our great. She's our, our uh, executive in charge yeah, of production. She's amazing. Yeah. And then uh, one day she was like, we got it. Let's do it. And then it was just full speed. After after that, we were in, when, in meetings immediately. The first day of meetings when I went in there, uh, I had never actually met you before that. Maybe once, but only through like emails and other people. Yeah. We hadn't actually met face to face. Yeah. Well, so I, I get, I go in there. And we're, we're talking, and he gives me like four tomes of all He-Man yeah. reference. But he's like, here, check these out. Yeah. And then we went to town, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and he also was like, here are the comic books that I wrote. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah you you he did give me that. I did. Really <laughs> like <those. laughs> Shameless. I was like, like, these no, are I shameless. Didn't. I didn't. Totally There's gonna be a quiz. Did. You better have read them. <laughs> I mean, you yeah. know, huh. <laughs> you kind of got to do that. Yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Was there ever a point where, you know, being a fan of the property, where they kept coming to you and they're like, we're probably going to do you man at some point? Were you nervous at all? Were you like, I don't know, because I'm a fan of it. I don't know if I want to really take this on. I, I want to make sure I, I we I was crush nervous, it. but I would, I, would have, I would kill to do it. Well, kill to have done you it. Did. We did it. You yeah. it it's can, now. Yeah. We've done it. We've done it. But I was like dying to do it. I was hoping at every lunch we'd, she'd be like, let's go, we're, we're, we're doing it. Yeah. So it was like a dream come true when, when, when it actually happened to actually affect, you know, uh, Motu for another generation is pretty amazing to me. Well, and even you guys just talking where it's like you hadn't met before and then you finally did and you're doing the show. How long was the process of this show from the first meeting that you guys had to now where it's about to come out on Netflix? From the production, from when it got real, it's been two years. Two years. It takes animation takes a long right. time, and it and it's one of those paradoxical things where it it all it takes forever to do, and also you can't change anything along the way because every <laughs> every like people are like if it's gonna take two years, we can do it. Like no, because every right. process and every department hands the baton off the next, mm -hmm. and you can't go backwards. So so. Like it actually takes those two years. It it's, takes those two so years. So if we shift it, it it's gonna be longer. Yeah. yeah, it does. I mean, there are times when we're each working on like ten or. 12 episodes at, at the same time, so. And we're still, we're, we're still, we're, still, we're actually, we've got the, the last few episodes right. of, this, of this order, this batch that we're just doing, and, and, the, and it's, that we're still now in production. And it's insane. I just want to say, it, the show just keeps getting better and better, which is another weird thing for shows. It's seriously, first season's good, but it gets yeah. way yeah. better, too. What is your guys' work process like? Talk me through a little bit, and without giving any crazy spoilers, when you're working on an episode or you're working on an idea, how does it how does it work with the two of you? Um, well, first we go through the you know well once we the, the script process you know we have um, you know we we basically have mapped out the the storyline for each of the seasons and then working closely with Brian and and the writers kind of map out exactly how we're going to hit these main themes across the thing and then once we get into that script the, we have that script locked. Um, you just break it down with HOC and then turn it to the animatic. Yeah, we get the script and then we then we have a, a meeting with HOC with the director and I'll launch the episode with the director. He'll give it to a storyboard artist and then we'll we'll start to get animation back first. Then we make all of our notes on the animation and then the CG, the lighting. I don't know, it's a lot of stuff. And, and HOC, the reason we went to HOC <laughs> is that they are tremendously great storytellers. So, you know, the scripts are are wonderful and it's and it's all there, but then the the boards 
like just bring it to life, but also tell a story in ways that you you mm -hmm. you didn't even think was possible. And then we it's kind of like the last one of the last drafts. The true last draft of anything is the music, and Michael uh, Kramer is is tre tremendous. Um, but we also, you know, and I, we've talked a lot about the good guys. Um, yes. and I, and I think we should, we should, uh, say something about the bad, the guys. bad guys. Um, well, the thing I think is cool is that, you know, like we joked about it earlier in the show that, um, you know, they didn't fight. He-Man and Skeletor didn't actually ever fight in the original series. And in Revelation, the stakes are so high. What are the stakes like in this series? The stakes are Big. I mean, there's more humor, um, but never at the expense of the actual um, stakes. Um, so one of the, the 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 core mythology of this is is taking the power of Grayskull and then looking at its kind of yin yang component with a, another energy, a shadow version of it um, called Havoc, which um, Skeletor wields as the the undisputed dark master of Havoc. And he didn't start off that way. We we totally embraced it. Prince Keldor, you get to actually see Prince Keldor and him being the actual uncle of, of Adam and how, and he covets the power of a skull, but yet if it's denied him, it's like kind of, not to get biblical here, but like the Lucifer, you mm -hmm. know, um, leaning into this other energy in order to tear down uh, Grayskull and create his own dark masters of the universe. And they have this nemesis conflict between each other and the whole universe is at stake. And it's really <laughs> learning how, um, you know, learning what it means to be a master in relation to the power of Grayskull. Right, and, and heroes are defined by their villains, so we were very serious about making them as scary as we can <laughs> without having parents get super angry at us. Yeah, yeah. But they're, yeah. they're pretty scary. So we have another clip. Because oh. um, we we're just brought some, some stuff, and this, mentioning Lucifer, this is basically, this, this clip is, is the moment where Keldor now as Skeletor basically says it's better to rule in hell than serve in heaven um, and basically declares what what his intention is for, for the universe. This is his villain speech. Yes. It was before <laughs> he set up his Dark Masters, but he's talking to Evelyn and Cronus. Yes. Let's take a look. How are we? Alive. I used the havoc to save you. We should get you back into one of those stasis shells before that leaves a mark. As you recover, I'm sure I can discern some way to reverse your affliction. Thanks, but no. My curse is a blessing in disguise. I've been looking at everything wrong for so very long. Brace up! The light I once sought to wield is the tool of a soldier, one who fights at the behest of others. Havoc, on the other hand, yeah. from the ruins of this fallen kingdom, from where the snakes fade to bring ancient Eternia to its knees, I will usher in an era, brimstone and light, that will bless the modern age and all ages yet to come. With the purity of havoc! The time of Grayskull has passed. Welcome to the Age of Skeletor! I just have to say that I came prepared today with the shirt on. Yes! <laughs> I'm not even going to try and do the lap. No. I tried too many times. It's terrible. Um, that moment is so cool. I also love that you're getting, like you said, a little bit of that more origin story. And that on this yeah. show, too, it's Evelyn. It is. And <laughs> this is a highly serialized story that is told, you know, every episode is a meal itself, but is a chapter. And you get to see these these characters go from the beginning towards towards the end, which we're actually working on right now. Ooh. But when I say yeah. end, it's <laughs> never the end because we will keep going um, as long as we can, as long as people are enjoying it. Well, and I got to ask selfishly. I know we got some little teasers today. We got a little taste of some stuff that people will see when this show comes out. Is there anything that you can maybe tease about Masters of the Universe Revelation? Revelation? Well, okay, I will say, because I can't, I can't say exactly when, but part two could come sooner than you think. It could come 
in a, at a holiday within this year. What holiday? We won't say, but a, a holiday within this year. And I think you're, I think you're gonna really enjoy it. That was so huh? vague. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very, very vague, yeah. very vague. One of a million holidays it could be. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for hanging out and chatting about the show. Rob and Jeff, thank you guys. I know that people are gonna be so pumped to see this. And it comes out on September 16th, globally on Netflix for Mattel Television, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. I'm Tiffany Smith and I'll see you guys later. Bye, thank you. Bye.